For Krema Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini, researcher and analyst. Professor Raymond Satna joins me to discuss a column titled Law and the Legal Profession in a Democracy Under Attack. Welcome, Professor. Good morning. So on the one hand, you suggest that the change in law after 1994 was revolutionary, but that the promise of the new framework has not been realized. Can you please el elaborate on that? Well, there have been, we've got a constitution which is more advanced uh, than just about every other constitution in the world. If you look at the Bill of Rights of the United States, mm. it is not as advanced as our Bill of Rights in terms of socio duty to provide socioeconomic benefits, developmental benefits mm -hmm. to people. And it's been further interpreted by the courts in ways that have increased these rights, particularly to the marginalized and the poor. So on the one hand, you have this legal system that is completely different from apartheid, and that is why I use the word revolutionary. Revolutionary doesn't mean violence, mm -hmm. some people think. It means mm -hmm. fundamental change. However, it has been undermined. It has been undermined partly through incompetence. For example, you see in the newspapers yesterday the Soweto police stations don't have rape kits mm -hmm. or schools, textbooks, deliveries, a whole lot of other mm -hmm. things that have happened over the years. But it has also been consciously undermined through corruption in the case of the Shabir Sheikh and a lot of other cases. Mm -hmm. But it's also been undermined through the phenomenon of state capture which may still well be continuing in the sense that it <coughs> entailed a parallel state whereby people connected to President Zuma and at that stage the Guptas, we didn't know as much about Bosasa, those people were getting inside information about the way the state was functioning mm -hmm. and they knew this tender is coming up. Then they would get secretly get the specifications, mm -hmm. what was required, and they would uh, uh, speak to some people on the amongst the decision makers and ensure that their people mm -hmm. got the tenders and they didn't necessarily deliver. So in a sense you had the undermining, a double undermining of the constitutional gains in that first of all, the processes no longer had integrity, mm -hmm. but secondly, in very many cases, they didn't deliver. The Estina Dairy Project in Free State is just one example mm -hmm. of this. And there are a lot of other examples where money has mm -hmm. been uh, misappropriated. But there was another story yesterday about the Gauteng, is it Gauteng Health Department where 84 people, no, the, or maybe the Department of Health, 84 people in the department are involved in business deals with their own department. Mm -hmm. Now that's completely irregular. So it's being undermined in these ways, and the Zondra Commission and previous work by the Public Protector and others have helped mm -hmm. to expose this and to try to realign <coughs> the state back to a way that advances this promise. Mm. And a lot of your article is devoted to a quotation about the equality before the law, suggesting that the court did not even know that Sir Ernest Oppenheimer was a wealthy man. Why is this important? See, it's very interesting because equality before the law is very important. Mm. Uh, that rich and poor, black and white, male and female, when they appear before the court, there's no difference between them. So on one level, the court treats everyone as if they're equal. But there's a problem with that, because not everyone is equal in terms of their means. Mm. And some people can never get to court uh, because they don't have 
the means. They don't mm -hmm. have a way of getting to the legal resources center or l lawyers for human rights, etc. So that's one problem. Other problem is, you see, they said in this judgment, um, council repeatedly said that I should call Sir Ernest Oppenheimer and I should not be deterred by the fact that he's a wealthy man. Mm. There isn't the court, if they said, knows no, does not know that Sir Ernest is a wealthy man. Mm. Now, it's demonstrated on the one hand a disjuncture mm. between the law and the um, factual wealth of the, the Oppenheimer family which everyone in the world knows about, mm. not just South Africa. <laughs> but it also uh, uh, creates a situation where you don't recognize that the capacity of a wealthy person to continue with a legal case is much greater than a poor person. In the first place, Sir Ernest can litigate till 2050 if, mm. if he needed to. Mm. But a person from Limpopo whose child has fallen into a pit toilet, uh, to get to court at all mm. is a huge problem. Mm. So I dwelt with this because it, we need in the new situation to understand that these rights mean nothing also if people can't get to court at all. Mm. And I was suggesting that LRC and other organizations need to find ways of raising funds as public interest bodies because mm. they can't get the funds from the state. The state is in real trouble. Mm. You also suggest that the courts also play an ideological role, that this was also the case under apartheid and it still is now. Can you explain how that role can be played now without compromising the independence of the judiciary? People don't like the word ideology because mm. they think ideology means untruths and things like that. It doesn't. I'm using it really to <coughs> mean that you uh, commend certain values to the public mm. and you give them meaning to what you're doing and what the court is doing, what the law does, mm. which uh, is meant to embed in people's consciousness some understanding. For example, when you're about to sentence and you say, society demands a heavy sentence in this case. Mm. First of all, it may be a political case. And when you say society, mm. you, you purport to speak on behalf of everyone, mm. but you are really speaking on those who support the regime. Mm. And what you're doing through that is you're legitimating the law of the time and the punish and you're delegitimating the freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. Now, in the present, what I would argue is the law still has that it always has an ideological function, but in the present situation, the constitution is a rights bearing constitution. And when the court explains, as it did in the case of corporal punishment at home, mm -hmm. when the court gives these judgments, it's educates the public about the meanings of rights mm. and that is an ideological role and it needs to actively do that because the weight of the court is very high because they are seen as non-partisan mm. in relation to political parties things like that thank you professor that was researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sartner speaking to Crima Media's policy about law and the legal profession in a democracy under attack.